Welcome everybody to Kick Scammers, the show where I, DJ Slope, look into the absolute worst Kickstarters, Indiegogos and GoFundMes to ever exist. And whilst I work on my next big Kick Scammer and Complete History episode, which will hopefully be live for Patreons and YouTube members by the time you watch this, I've decided to release a compilation of some of the absolute worst people I have ever covered on the platform. One of which was seriously painful for me to make as he was a childhood hero of mine and after I made that video, he reached out to me. Yep, the first time I ever got to interact with my childhood hero was after I called him out for being a... Well, you'll soon see. Make sure you leave a comment down below with who you think I should have added. And no, not him. It's way too soon for that. And um, oh, by the way, when it does come down to the Amigo, make sure you hit the subscribe button as some... Um, some rather big news may be dropping over the next month or so. Anyway, let's get into it and watch Kickstarter's Worst People. Welcome to Slopes Game Room. But before going on, a quick word from this video's sponsor, Fun Plus, who have provided me with free games that they would like me to share with you, including State of Survival, the ultimate MMORPG survival game set in a zombie apocalypse filled world, available for free on all devices including iOS, Android and Windows. Your first task is to build and secure settlements and resist the constant wave of zombies coming for you. You gotta terminate any threats and clear the infected areas around your settlement with the FPS mode. Can you rescue other survivors before they get infected and increase the power of your base by training them? You can also collect heroes with unique abilities and upgrade them too, which will, of course, increase your squad power. Do all of this whilst following the excellent storyline that always gets expanded on with daily missions as you get to know the main heroes of state survival. Make allies, forge strategic partnerships, and most importantly, survive the exclusive events by checking out the event billboard. Download now using the link in the description or by clicking that unique QR code seen on the screen. And don't forget to use special code FUNPLUS under player profile settings and gift code to claim your special welcome pack. Or why not check out game number two, King of Avalon, the best real-time MMO that again is available for free on all devices including iOS, Android and Windows. Get your armor on and march your way through friends or foes in order to lift Excalibur and become the king. Win tower defense battles, deploy heroes and troops freely, or summon the dragon to defeat waves of the unmelted, who are ready to claim your kingdom. Then you gotta raise and upgrade your dragon in order to make them the powerful protector that your kingdom needs, as you command and train your troops to shield and protect the city. Make sure that you repair the city as you go along by collecting resources like gold, wood and food, and don't forget to upgrade your heroes whilst you're at it so you can complete different missions to rescue residents and govern the rain. Just like before, King of Avalon features an amazing storyline that plays out even better when you join an alliance to increase your construction and research speeds. Make sure to safeguard your territory and in turn get rare items from the alliance store, and do all of this whilst playing with other King of Avalon players from around the world. You've got links down below and a QR code on the screen, and of course, don't forget to download your welcome back typing in fun play plus KOA. And finally, we got game number three, Guns of Glory. Get ready for the next era of MMO war with the strategy classic Guns of Glory, a free-to-play game available on iOS and Android. You have escaped Bastille Prison, your airship has landed on an estate that's under attack by the Cardinal who wants to claim the throne. It's up to you to secure the estate and start strategizing against these forces. In order to stand a chance against the Red Guards, you will need extra help. Recruit heroes to join your forces, collect resources, and restore the estate. Guns of Glory will put your battle skills to the test as you defend your base from ground, sea and air. Follow the epic storyline and unravel the secrets behind Cardinal's evil scheming, complete the chapters, events and daily missions and in turn collect rewards. Join an alliance and increase your construction and research speeds, safeguard your territory and get rare items in the alliance store. Download Guns of Glory now by clicking the link in the description or by scanning the QR code and don't forget to go to the player profile, settings, gift codes and add code FUNPLUS to get yourself a nice welcome pack. Anyway, thanks to FUNPLUS for sponsoring today's video but for now let's continue you on with the video. Hey folks, I'm John Kay. Uh, you know the Ren and Snippy guy? Listen, I got a cartoon I'm dying to make and I'd love to do it just directly for you without having to go through a whole bunch of TV executive rigmarole. So this Kickstarter thing is really great. It's a way for uh, you know guys like me to make this stuff directly for you. This is the original concept behind the campaign. John Kay, the beloved John Kay at the time, took to Kickstarter to create a new short without having to go through all of the rigmarole of trying to make it for TV. 
It seemed pretty standard practice for someone like this, created back in the height of Kickstarter's popularity and only asking for $110,000, and as stated, it smashed it. It was a pretty simple, very John K idea, George Licker American, gets these cans without labels from the shops crazily cheap because nobody knows what's inside. Obviously it was going to be disgusting whatever was in the can, and the strict father figure would make the kids eat it no matter what. So if you want to see what's in this can, help me finish the cartoon. Once we open this can, we have to eat whatever's in it. Sounds perfect for a fan of John K, which I am, and that's why it did so well. During the campaign's life, the updates were seriously constant. I'm talking every day, and sometimes multiple times a day. Each post would be signed off by John himself, and to be fair, I've got no reason to believe otherwise, as his assistant, El Fett, did actually update sometimes later on in the campaign's life, and there seemed to be no hiding the fact that she was doing so. You see, John, after the days of Ren and Stimpy between the adult party cartoon stuff, and then between that and this Kickstarter, did keep himself busy enough doing random music videos and whatnot by posting stuff on the internet. Yep, he did all of this on his own blog, pretty much daily, again, and he still does. And his online store was where you could buy plenty of artwork and what have you, resulting in his legendary status becoming his main source of income. Fair play. John Kay was a hugely popular artist and a unique artist too, so much so that he could make a living just selling random scribbles, or as he calls them, phone doodles, aka the stuff that he would scribble down whilst on the phone. <laughs> yes, stuff that most people would just, you know, scribble down on a bit of paper while they're talking on the phone and then, you know, obviously throw that away. People like me and hardcore fans of John Kay would actually pay good money for those scraps of paper. And yes, he definitely doodled this image whilst on the phone because there is a phone number that he scribbled out on the bit of paper. Uh, although it's very, very, very obvious what that phone number is. Hmm. When the campaign was over, everything seemed fine. The updates obviously slowed down, but still, nothing too bad. And John did explain he had a mistake regarding the release date of the cartoon itself. Not by much, just a few months, and, well, everybody was fine with that. However, the time between those updates, obviously, as you would expect, got longer and longer, as he worked on projects outside of Cans Without Labels, and this continued for a good couple of years after the expected release date. Yep, that was a preview of The Simpsons Couch Gag back on February the 4th, 2016, back when he explained he only had a few bits needed to be done before Cans Without Labels would be complete. And a whole year and a half later, John came back for another update. And by this point, August 6th, 2017, people had become incredibly pissed off with the animator that they trusted. And finally, all of those times that we as fans had stood by him whilst people like Nickelodeon had moaned about his horrific timekeeping, well, they'd just been proven firsthand, hadn't they? This update explained it was finally finished, and when this notification popped up, and I remember finally feeling that sigh of relief that this mini episode I backed five years earlier was finally going to come out. But sadly, this was the final update for a whole year and eight months. Seriously, the 11 minute video was apparently finished. And I've got no reason to believe otherwise, and even though everyone was entitled to a digital version to this very day, I've still not received my copy of Cans Without Labels, and from what I can tell, that goes for absolutely everybody else. Sure, I have seen it, and I'm sure you have too, it's not hard to find. 
but even though some of those backers who have got DVDs literally within the last few days, nobody has officially got a digital copy of a show that was reportedly finished almost two years ago. But like I said, I have seen it and it's well, it's okay, I suppose. There seems to be a whole lot of hate going around regarding it, but honestly, it's pretty much exactly what I expected. John K going mental, doing what John K does when he's 100% left in charge. And as stated in my previous video, his best work was when he was working with a team of people on those first two seasons of Ren and Stimpy. He had limitations in place and those limitations turned a child friendly duo into a slightly edgy and obviously sometimes boundary pushing cartoon that has fully stood the test of time. Whereas stuff like this and this is far more what I was expecting. There are an insane amount of animators saying that he has done so much wrong, he's broken animation laws, the camera is all wobbly, the sound is out <laughs> and he's ripping off Donald Duck. And to that, I say, <sighs> again, what was you expecting? John has been very vocal about his animation abilities and he spends every single morning, according to his blog, eating bacon and becoming more and more and more abstract with his doodles and all of that crazy crap that you all hate, actually might be on purpose. In fact, I believe it is. This absolute mess of a cartoon comes from a guy that draws stuff like this, scans it in and shares it with all of us on a daily basis. Now, I'm not defending it, I'm just saying I'm not surprised. You've all seen the Simpson couch gags and Tenacious D music videos, right? It's John's old style turned all the way up whilst creating it all in Toon Boom, hence why it's got that advanced flash animation feel about it. I much prefer the classic Ren and Stimpy style and it surprises me that someone that's so obsessed with early animation would take his animation path down a road like this. But with that said, he's been doing this for quite a while and that's why I'm not shocked at the output. No, I don't like the weird CGI mixed with 2D animation. Yes, the audio is very, very wonky. In fact, I think it's a mix between Mike and John himself. But most of all, I don't like him quite literally taking his never draw the same face twice concept to the absolute extreme. There is so much going on in this 11 minute cartoon that it's in some places almost unwatchable. But with that said, again, I kind of guessed it would be like this. Well, maybe not this crazy, but still, you get what I'm saying. I personally slapped down $30 to get original artwork and to support someone that, again, like I said in previous videos, had an enormous impact on my life. I loved and still do love Ren and Stimpy. It's one of many cartoons and mediums that shaped me into the guy I am today. But John Kay is a 62-year-old guy that's so obsessed with classic animation that he's kind of lost the plot. He draws entire trees worth of doodles every single day and he's done so for the last 50 years. He's stupidly talented, no one can deny that. However, with that said, it's obvious he's created his own very surreal, warped style and this cartoon shows it. So in review, cans without labels, it's a pretty damn average cartoon and that's really the best review I can give it. And even though you might hate it, John obviously didn't and I'm sure he would be happy with this being his ending legacy of what was once one of the world's greatest animators. Because sadly for him, it won't be. You see between these final two updates over on Kickstarter, quite a lot came out about the man behind Cans Without Labels and Red and Stimpy and what have you the real John K came to light. And sadly now, when you hear the name John K, you're not gonna think of Cans Without Labels or Ren and Stimpy. You're gonna think of this. <sighs> Talk about throwing away an entire life's work. Back in the day, I, plus plenty of other kids that grew up in the 90s, drawing what we saw on TV, would have loved to have worked on the shows that we were obsessed with. And for anybody out there that actually paid attention to the end of those cartoons, would see the title card for the animation studio, Spumco. John Kay's Animation Studio, the studio behind the first two seasons of Ren and Stimpy. Look, there's Jimmy the Idiot Boy, one of the other characters that Nickelodeon offered to buy. The, um, sort of mascot for the company, if you will. 
Well, Robin Bird was one of those young kids, 13 years old to be exact, that reached out to John by sending him a video of herself talking about her cartoons and the future that she wished to have in animation. Surprisingly, the 39-year-old John Kay actually replied. He sent her art supplies, pictures, toys, figurines. You name it, she probably got it from John. And he even helped her set up her own AOL account to speak with him and flew over to her trailer park home to meet her. A few years later, when she was 16, he flew her to meet him. And my God, imagine this. As a young teenager obsessed with animation, he actually showed her Spumco Animation Studios, which was when he molested the poor girl. Yes. One year later, he flew her out again to work at Spumco, and she became his girlfriend too. Shortly after, as Robin grew to realise the twisted ways of John, she obviously left the relationship and didn't look back. Many years later, after reconnecting with an old animation friend, Katie Rice, she discovered that she wasn't the only underage girl that John had groomed into her arms. Showering the young ones with gifts, sending flirty letters, as well as downright obvious sexual harassment when actually working with them, John Kay, it seems, was on a mission. A mission to get with the same kind of young girls that he often drew in his cartoons. And just to be clear, the articles to actually break these stories have seen the transcripts between them backing up these allegations. Katie Rice is now an adult and understands the messed up situation that John put her through and thankfully she is still an animator. Look, here she is alongside John Kay talking about the messed up Naked Beach Frenzy cartoon. Hi. Hey, this is Katie Rice. She is one of the young artists I was telling you about who sought me out because she grew up watching Ren and Stimpy, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Katie showed me one time. She drew, uh, I was at her 15th birthday party. Uh, we'll tell you that backstory a little bit later. <laughs> There's no denying that John Kay is an extremely talented man, and these two girls he most definitely groomed, oh and by the way there's actually believed to be many more, are better artists for working alongside him. But sadly that counts for nothing when you look at how he treated them, plus no doubt many others. Here is an official statement from John Kay's legal representative. The 1990s were a time of mental and emotional fragility for Mr. Chris Falusi, especially after losing Ren and Stimpy, his most prized creation. For a brief time, 25 years ago, he had a 16-year-old girlfriend. Over the years, John struggled with what were eventually diagnosed mental illnesses in 2008. To that point, for nearly three decades, he had relied primarily on alcohol to self-medicate. Since that time, he's worked feverishly on his mental health issues and has been successful in stabilising his life over the last decade. This achievement has allowed John the opportunity to grow and mature in ways he'd never had a chance at before. Yep, there you have it. No matter what you choose to believe in all of this from these two victims, it's official. At the very least, he did have a 16-year-old girlfriend, and although obviously all of the sexual charges are not official, they're kind of alleged, I suppose, it does seem pretty legit. Even John himself ended up posting this crazy long <laughs> apology letter that Bird and Rice, without a doubt, refused to accept. He, however, did accept that some parts of the stories were true, and some were very exaggerated. Regardless, even if only a small percentage was true, it's simply horrific that it happened at all. And as stated, all of this happened between the final two updates from John on his Kickstarter. Not only did he let down over 3,000 of his most devoted fans, but he also changed his image from one of the most beloved animators in history to one of the absolute worst. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is sadly what he will be remembered for. And rightfully so. Oh boy. Is this one weird? What a way to start an episode. 
So how many people out there know of or have seen Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton. You know what I'm talking about. Disney Plus's most recently highly rated um, movie. No, it's not a movie, is it, Mr. Oscar? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Regardless, Hamilton the Stage Show, perfectly filmed, edited, and released as a movie, is doing rather well for itself right now on Disney Plus. <laughs> now, don't you worry, guys. I'm not going to be giving away any spoilers or anything like that in this particular episode for people that don't know. All you do need to know is that this is an urban themed musical based on the founding father, Alexander Hamilton. Good. You got that? Excellent. Okay. So keep that thought into the back of your mind right now as I introduce you to the HIV Living Tumblr blog. Now, as you may have already pieced together yourself, this blog discusses living with HIV. The two individuals behind the blog are Naj, a black lesbian, and Isra, a non-binary Chinese Pakistani human trafficking survivor, and yes, they are both HIV positive. And this blog is to, for the most part, discuss the struggles that they go through and have been through. It sounds like quite the messy backstory, right? Even someone like myself that honestly never really uses Tumblr does find these blog posts rather interesting. The duo built up a fairly decent sized following of well-wishers and people interested in the blog and as you may expect, a sort of fundraiser was set up. This time over on Cash.me. Yes, that's a first for the channel guys. And this was set up to help with medical bills. Now, you may be asking what the hell does this all have to do with Hamilton? Well, not only did these guys chat about their traumatic past, they also used the blog to promote their Hamilton fan fiction, where Alexander Hamilton is portrayed as a high school student in the 1980s living with HIV. And that is not the weirdest part of this fan fiction. As it was later discovered that yet another fan fiction was created by them of Hamilton that changed the American founding father Alexander Hamilton into a cannibalistic mermaid. Anyway, enough of the crazy, let's get back to the money raising. Now apparently when donating via cash.me, the money needs to go to an American bank account, something that two individuals who apparently are living in India just wouldn't have. Another Tumblr user actually worked all of this out and messaged them, giving them three days to come clean and explain what the hell was going on. And after several messages between them, it was revealed that the black lesbian and non-binary Chinese Pakistani Indian residents living with HIV are actually just a single white American college student that doesn't have HIV and made the whole thing up to help promote their version of the heavily HIV focused Hamilton remake. <sighs> now that's one sentence I never thought I would ever need to say. Okay, so in my attempt to make this episode ever so slightly less morbid, I think it's probably best that I do one of these segments that actually has nothing to do with death at all. But how are you going to do that, Daniel? <laughs> well, simple, by talking about people that pretend they are going to die. A lot of this episode came from the website Go Fraud Me, and on that website there is an entire section based on people that pretend to have cancer in return for money. <laughs> Can you believe it? The worrying thing is how many people actually get away with this stuff. I suppose it's times like these that it's probably best you don't think about it. Regardless, the length these scammers go to, and I'm talking true, 100% bad boy scammers go to to trick people into believing them, is completely crazy. And the one I'm going to be chatting about today is this chick right here, 35-year-old Alicia Perini. Someone that said she had cancer, but didn't. Besides me telling you that she earned £28,000 doing just this, that should really be enough for this segment, right? Move on, Daniel, I hear you say. Well, let's see how far this chick, and possibly her boyfriend, took it. One day, Alicia claimed that she had a brain tumour and asked her boyfriend to set up a GoFundMe as she only had months to live. He did, and the money was raised as stated. 
However, when looking at the Turtle Boy Sports blog, it appears she went even further with this too on Facebook. Firstly, she got a tattoo. <laughs> yes, this lass actually got a tattoo saying, Cancer may have started the fight, but I will finish. Um, it, I presume. I just want to say one last time that this was all fake. She actually admitted that the GoFundMe was a fake. <laughs> nice artwork though, right? Here's another post from Facebook claiming that she's riding out the storm after a chemo session. Now, this is where I'm a little unsure. The boyfriend didn't know what was going on. Look, he's right here. I mean, it's not impossible that she was that cunning, but I have my doubts. But hey, who knows? Here she is being strong and powerful as her hair starts to fall out and she continues being a free-spirited lass with a mohawk. Oh no, not puppy puke. And the doctor thinks it might be colon cancer? I mean, this might be true, but then again, look who's writing it. Oh yeah, by the way, that guy, that's her father, who actually did sadly pass away the same year that this was all going on, as seen here by his online obituary. Wait, what does that final sentence say? Donations may be made to support his daughter Alicia's medical fund as she undergoes cancer treatment at www.gofundme.com forward slash alicia dash perini's dash medical dash <laughs> that <fund>. is low <laughs> like really low wow okay let's continue here's another post claiming that she has to double her dosage on the next fake chemo session and here's another post showing her fighting power via one of those annoying e-cards things here she is, fully head shaven now, eyebrows and all, and finally here she is at 3 o'clock in the bloody morning just Facebook checking in at the hospital, which police eventually rang and confirmed she was never a patient at when this all came out. Maybe it's just me loving sleep too much, but my god, that is dedication. Anyway, back to the boyfriend, now as stated, in reports I've seen, he was apparently none the wiser. I mean, heck, he even got inked with their names too. He also flew with her to Chicago. Oh man, I do love me some Giordano's pizza. Oh wait, here's another trip over into Scotland. Now they're in Florida. Now they're in Costa Rica. And finally, he goes alone to Massachusetts. Well, I think it's safe to say that it's pretty obvious where all the money went, right? Like I said, this makes it hard for me to believe that he didn't know about it. But then again, his own mother did donate $5,000 herself. <laughs> Whoa. It's still early days for this one, sadly, guys, so the sentencing of this eyebrowless Alicia is yet to be set. GoFundMe have yet again refunded all the backers of this campaign, which is obviously good. And that's the end of that. Oh well, at least she'll always have that tattoo to remind her of the time that she screwed all of her families and friends over. <laughs> God. Hey everybody, the show's on. Look familiar? Who are you? I'm Butch Hartman. I've been in the entertainment industry for over 30 years. Uh. How'd you get in here? <laughs> Doggy door. I love entertainment and I'm so excited to give you the opportunity to help me impact culture. <laughs> Parents, aren't you tired of being constantly terrified that your child is going to see something that they shouldn't? I mean, family time barely exists anymore. So, basically, what Butch Hartman wants to do is 
kind of do what's already available. Netflix has a children's section, Disney Plus has parental locks for everything that isn't child friendly, Amazon Prime does too, heck the vast majority of streaming services that offer children's programming offer these sections. And as stated, you can lock off what else is available if you feel the need to, even my daughter's crappy tablet is locked off and again only features kid content. So what's so different about this particular service? Butch Hartman is the difference. And he even wants you to upload your own content too, by the way. Kinda like YouTube Kids. <laughs> Although any parents out there that has actually ever used YouTube Kids will probably tell you that, yeah, that particular service might need a bit of an overhaul. Anyway, yes, the nitty gritty of this whole campaign is the fact that it's a subscription-based streaming service that is 100% safe and for the whole family and wouldn't just include movie and TV shows, but specifically it would also feature sports, fitness, reality, news and even video games. Family-friendly news and sports? Who's doctoring what the kids watch now, Butch? The goal of $250,000 was simply the first phase of startup costs, which would include developing the streaming video platform, hiring creative staff and producers to create original content, and acquiring completed projects that fit the family focused entertainment model. Of course, the campaign hit its goal. 1,290 backers got it up to $268,134, thanks to a rather massive push right at the end of the campaign. As many of you know, I'm launching a brand new streaming service called Oaxis Entertainment, and we launched a Kickstarter for it four weeks ago. Today is the last day you can contribute to the Kickstarter, and we only have hours left. Not days, hours. <laughs> There's just hours left, and depending on when you watch this, it might be minutes, but we are coming down to the wire. I'm trying to raise $250,000. We are so close to hitting our goal. All I need is 600 people to give me $99 and that's it. <laughs> yes, as stated, he hit his goal with some very questionable bids right at the end of the campaign, but still, he did hit his goal. And the comments were nothing but good. Lots of congratulations from fairly odd fans being sold the very vague dream of a brand new streaming service for only $250,000, even though not a single design plan or anything similar was shown for this mammoth project. And those same people actually ended up commenting again more recently, however this time with a slightly different tone. I backed this project near the start of this pledge window. I wish I hadn't at all. Not only did you keep your true intentions for this service a secret, you haven't even been able to show any progress whatsoever. It's been over two years and yes, I'm on the mailing list. No updates whatsoever. Why are you lying about this? What do you have to hide? Because you certainly don't try and hide Ooh, our salty, salty, salty. So what exactly happened here? Well... On July 18th, the newly Going It Alone animators campaign was successful, and then nothing. No thanks, no nothing. Well, eventually he did say thanks on social media, but on Kickstarter, again, nothing. The YouTube channel had also had a sort of nothing update too leading up to this point. Seriously, this was just about as vague as the Kickstarter itself, but hey, it doesn't matter. Because again, this is the almighty Butch Hartman. He also did a live stream on Kickstarter, literally hours before it ended, where he continued to be super vague, dodging questions related to if the network would be LGBTQ friendly. I mean, honestly, at first I wasn't exactly sure the question needed to be asked at all, considering all of the updates on social and in this Kickstarter itself did drive home that same one point, and that was that the service would be for everyone. Still, it was asked, and even though it's an extremely simple question with an even more extremely simple answer, it was asked multiple times, and it was asked in a room with very few people in attendance, and what was alarming was that Butch straight up ignored the question multiple times, which got the skeptics worrying. Now, as confused as you may be about this particular questioning, when you do dig a little deeper, 
you start to understand why people were so skeptical. Turns out that a video had been discovered online with Butch at a very pro-Christian conference of some kind, where it showed off just how much of a Christian he was. And although I'm pretty sure we can all agree that 99.99999% recurring of all Christians are good, honest people, no different than the majority of other people who have nothing against the LGBTQ community, the dodging of this very simple question along with this very heavy Christian based conference footage gave the skeptics plenty more fuel for the fire. Now, <laughs> as a content creator this is normally the part of the video where I would come at you and say that I have a trans friend, a gay friend, a black friend, a religious friend, whatever friend I need to have to justify to you guys that I see people equally. But let's get real. You don't need proof of that from me. We all have friends that live differently than you and me. It's meaningless, especially from some guy on a screen on your phone that you're watching while sitting on the bog. It doesn't matter who your friends or my friends are, as long as we all treat people equally and we respect one another's way of life, then in my eyes, that's all it takes. And sure, yes, he is a Christian, and yes, a very small minority of this and many other religious and non-religious people unfortunately think the opposite way, there's no reason to jump to these conclusions. In my personal opinion, the only problem I have is when a particular belief system, obviously I'm talking about religion here, is forced onto someone that doesn't share that same belief. Talking about it is absolutely fine. Respecting one another should always be encouraged. However, forcing or worse, tricking people into religion is not. Which is why if I was a backer to what looked like an albeit very flawed but financially successful family only streaming service, I would have been pretty wound up when in this particular conference he thanks God and claims to have been given an assignment to make this streaming service not only family friendly, yeah, 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 but to also, and I quote, shift the narrative in Hollywood, save cultures, save lives, and although he claims this will not be a Christian network, he will release a channel that will have these qualities and will reach the entire other side of the spectrum. And finally, he also states that since he got the ball rolling on this entire project, the whole thing has moved forward so fast and so quick, simply because he gave it all to him, aka he gave it all to God. In many people's eyes, this now deleted conference footage was proof enough to show that this streaming service was going to be a heavily Christian based streaming service rather than anything else and there was nothing anywhere in this campaign's entire life that said that. Well, not up until the very last few hours of the campaign. This was when that Twitter thank you note came into play. Butch just found himself in a tough spot. Not only did he have to double down on the fact that no, this was not a Christian service, but at the same time, he had to please his Christian supporters who had also rallied together to support this service. <laughs> Look. I get it. This particular video isn't exactly as cut and dry as my other kick scammer videos and hey, you may think differently, but please do hold judgment because it gets a whole lot worse. During this conference, Butch goes on to explain that even though places like Netflix have kids sections, they don't have family sections and as a result, they no longer sit around together watching films. It just wasn't like that back in his day. He knows kids that have committed suicide and this kind of thing was just a lot less frequent back in his day and the reason for this is influence. We are apparently influenced by what we see online or on TV and this is one of the reasons that people commit suicide. Now this is where people started to get a little bit more upset. The incredibly vague project had nothing going for it when it launched. Well, nothing besides the one and only Butch Hartman himself. A name we love, a name we respect, and a name that got a project that we know almost nothing about past its $250,000 goal. And because it was so vague, backers had no choice but to fill in the blanks themselves. And let me just make this abundantly clear here, and to make sure people do not see this as a way of labeling all religious or more specifically Christian people the same way, 
It is also worth noting that when Butch mentions the seven mountains of influence in this conference, what he's actually talking about is the hardcore Christian belief that Jesus will not return until Christianity consumes all aspects of our lives. Those being media, government, education, economy, family, religion, and celebration. Hence why our axis wasn't marketed directly for Christians, but for everyone, with again, absolutely no mention of Christianity anywhere on the page. You see the problem? Every time someone questioned Butch about all of this, the response was nothing. Or worse, it was completely ignored. There was no public game plan that you would expect from a project like this. There was no evidence that he could actually even do any of it either. There was no idea given as to what shows would be on the service. There was nothing. Nothing but Butch Hartman telling you that it'll all be okay and some very late in the campaign's life discovered footage that gave off the impression that the streaming service was going to be a Christian focused service designed to be viewed by people on the other side of the spectrum. And that is why this particular project received an almost complete U-turn of support from the backers once it was too late and after the money had been raised. On top of this, Butch's reputation had been on a bit of a downward spiral for a short while, and unless you followed him closely, you may not have known that. Unfortunately for him, when you are semi-famous and you run a not necessarily overly successful campaign, but an extremely newsworthy one, people will indeed talk. They will spread the news on every little thing that you say and do, and more importantly, take notice of you and your rather strange behaviours a tad more. Here are just a few more examples of the now very controversial Butch Hartman. Calling non-creative people out and refusing to listen to them. You know what's funny? Wait, I want to say one more thing. You know, as, as many things I've done in my life, like, like being a father, being a husband, being a, uh, um, you know, a guy who's in his 50s who's or done... Boss. Or a boss, a guy who's done shows, a guy who's stayed up late at night working really hard. To answer questions from people who've never done anything and then they want to criticize, I, I just, it's, it makes me laugh. It makes me laugh. It's like, really? That's your question? So it's, it's, it's quite amusing, actually. Calling introverts selfish. People that are introverts, I want to encourage you all, um, don't be an introvert. Because being an introvert is, uh, and all people, I'm, I'm probably going to get a lot of flack over saying this. If you're an introvert, it's a very selfish thing to be. And here's why. Because it's all about you. You're self-centered. You don't want to get out of yourself and go like, well, maybe I could communicate with these people. Uh, well, I'm just an introvert. I'm going to sit over here. People have to figure out what I'm thinking. Because you're putting, you're making everybody else uncomfortable when you're an introvert like that. Because no one knows what you're thinking. No one knows how you're feeling. And no one knows what to communicate with you. If you're going to be a showrunner or a, a leader in any way, you're going to have to be a communicator. How about jokingly blaming the death of a famous voice actress on another famous voice actress? But Tara was not the original Timmy Turner. The original actress was Mary Kay Bergman, who sadly passed away. But She, she was, was such a sweet, sweet lady. Sweet lady. Mm -hmm. She also did a bunch of voices on South Park when uh -huh. that first started. Yeah. She was the mom on South Park. No, she had a very prolific career. She was awesome. Doing great. And then she ended up passing away. And uh, I think Tara actually had something to do with that. And so <laughs> that's probably what, that was probably your fault. Uh -huh. No, I'm kidding. Sorry guys, I had to actually use this overused edited clip for this segment as the original upload has had this part edited out. As has a whole heap of his social media posts on places like Twitter because by this point, the hate was real. Anyway, moving on. He hired a young animator by the name of Kuro to create the short anime line parody version of one of his shows, most likely due to the Spongebob videos of the same nature doing so well. And then he out of nowhere terminated the project without paying the animator, even though it was agreed in contract that he would get paid the full amount regardless of how far along he was. All communication stopped between the two had worked together for the last four years up to this point, and the shared Google Drive full of all the contracted files was deleted. Eventually, with the internet blowing up on everything Butch did from this point, the amount was eventually and no doubt reluctantly paid. 
Ah yes, the plagiarism artwork stuff, in case you didn't know. If you like a certain artist's style, you can, in some cases, pay them a set fee to draw you whatever you want, in their own style or whatever style you both agree on, and Butch was no different. Pay him $200, say you like that lass from Attack on Titan, and boom, here it is, a completely unoriginal piece of work practically traced, aka stolen, by another artist. Boy, oh boy, do you not want to be winding up the Art Commission community out of everything he's ever done. If you went back and looked at the backlash during that same time period on Twitter, you would think he just started World War 3. Artists, rightfully so, kick up such a massive fuss and then some when stuff like this goes down and boy, oh boy, did this help blow up his popularity even more. All in the wrong ways, of course. After all, he was an animator himself, a successful animator that had inspired thousands, possibly millions of artists, and now he's getting paid a measly $200 and copying their work to bring home that bacon. You know all of those channels that have like hand-drawn little characters with lots of different expressions that they use to kick off about whatever story is blowing up that week? I think they all got him for this one. And it doesn't end there, you got the multiple occasions where he downplayed mental issues, illnesses and even a stated suicide as something that was primarily controlled by the content that they consume, which of course was the reason his Araxis platform was so great in his eyes. Before continuing on, if you have any of these involuntary traits like being an introvert or on the more hardcore side of the scale, someone who is suicidal, don't take the Butch Hartman advice and just get over it or pray, heck still not working, pray a little harder, because studies show that that is not going to work. All I really want to say on this matter from my own personal views, that being someone who has touch wood never had to deal with these issues personally, so take it with a grain of salt, just being honest here, is that I at least understand that he thinks he's doing the right thing, but it's been proven time and time again that the bottle it up or wish for it to go away method is just not the right way to go. Now again, I'm just as qualified to be talking about this as Butch himself, so take what I say with a grain of salt as stated, but yeah, guys, from what I've seen in the real world and from the people out there that have actually reached out to me and thanked me for creating content that maybe have helped them through a tough time in their lives, do not bottle it up. Reach out and speak to someone if you can. It's a great first step. You may think you're alone, but you're not. And hey, if you don't want to take a couple of unqualified people's opinions on the matter, like Butch and me, there are many much more qualified people out there that are happy to talk to you in confidence, and I will try my best to leave a few links down below if you do need them. My advice is again not to listen to Butch if you suffer from any of the previously mentioned symptoms, and especially do not listen to him if you have autism. Now, in all fairness, this is more Butch's wife Julian's hardcore beliefs as she is a founder of the Healing Founders Conference that claims prayers and hardcore beliefs of faith can cure you of autism, the same Julian whose name is signed at the end of the vast majority of updates on this particular campaign I might add, the same Julian who decides to remedy her symptoms by researching them online and she doesn't trust doctors and never takes any medicine whatsoever, even though she has actually claimed to have also spent $300 thousand dollars on the stuff it's all very odd and dare i say it the bethel church which is a group of um heavy-handed christians that believes in these slightly more hardcore beliefs feels a little bit cult-like if i was going to be going deeper with this religious group it would get a little ott and again i'm happy for you to choose to believe whatever you believe as long as it's respectful and not forceful onto other people and this is where our story all links together. Remember when I said I didn't quite understand the reasoning as to why that backer asked if the upcoming Oaxis service would feature LGBTQ content or would be LGBTQ friendly and why the Hartmans seemed to dodge that question? 
It finally makes sense when you find out that the leader of the Bethel Church was urging his followers to email or call the legislators who were responsible in deciding if conversion therapy should become illegal. And I'll let you guys guess what stance he was suggesting they take. Now, of course, yet again, we can only assume that the Hartmans felt the same way, but considering there is proof that they are so heavily ingrained into this part of the church and they actively dodged the questioning, yeah, I actually do think it's a fair assumption to make. Whew. So, with all of that out of the way, what has actually happened to the Oaxis service? A whole lot of nothing. Well, on the Kickstarter itself at least. If you want updates, you needed to sign up to a mailing list which according to the commenters has never had an update sent out. Thankfully over the years, fans and of course critics have been keeping an eye on all of this unfold and between them have discovered that the now missing website Oaxis.tv, which was full of obviously stolen artwork giving off the impression that Oaxis has the rights to shows and movies such as Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and Star Wars movies too, which although I don't have proof of, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't. <laughs> It also stated that the $250,000 raised is nowhere near enough to even make the website and that it will need to stop the build whilst it raises more funds and yes, seriously, that's it. A few YouTubers managed to actually get into what was obviously the placeholder of this streaming service would look like, which was completely broken, completely full of copyrighted or simply his own YouTube video thumbnails, which of course didn't work, and absolutely nothing else. This was what $268,134 got you. Now in Butch's ideal world, I'm sure he thinks, or should I say he has faith, that the money can be raised. But considering Oaxis TV now just directs you to his own website, and of course he has pretty much intoxicated the vast majority of his own fan base, my guess is he's never going to be able to pull it off. And yes, if you are talking about streaming services that are never going to make it and are built on a bed of lies, the exact same can indeed be said for Anime Tube. But that's a story for another time. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's not often on Kickscammers you will find me talk about a good campaign, but today is one of those days. Don't worry, it's still an absolute crazy story. You see, this is Alex Hebeling, and looking at her Kickstarter activity, it's easy to see that she is indeed quite the fan of Kickstarter. Hey folks, for those of you who don't know me, I am Alex, and I make webcomics. She's backed no less than 30 projects and opened up four of her own, three of which were very much successful and everyone involved, backers included, seemed to be happy with the results. Yet, although pretty small time compared to some of the mammoth projects featured on this show in the past, Alex looked to be quite the role model for people looking to get into crowdfunding. She needed a humble $3,000 which she got when 84 people pledged $4,300 to work full time on the third chapter of her webcomic about seven young women who discover they are defenders of the planet amidst a devastating alien invasion. So take a look at the campaign info below and thanks for checking out my Kickstarter. I hope you're all having a great day. Bye. As I've said, the campaign hit its goal comfortably and everything was honky dory. That was until a certain backer by the name of Ensik Farhan, which is believed to be Mr. Farhan, although even those are probably not his real name, well, he came onto the scene and slapped down a sexy $1,000 to help her campaign. Now it's pretty obvious where I'm going to be going with this one, right? Well, not so much. If anyone out there's watched my previous Dimension Drive video, which there'll be a card at the top of the screen if you haven't, kick trolling is, or at least it was, quite a common thing on the platform. And for those that don't know what it is, let me explain. 
A backer slaps down loads of money. The campaign owners get very excited. And then the backer retracts it simply because they are douchebags that just like to completely crush the high spirits of good, honest Kickstarter campaign owners. However, this one is a little bit different. Unlike that campaign where they retracted the money, or at least the campaign owners were informed just before it ended, this time the money actually went through. Yes, Alex managed to take the full $4,300, minus fees of course, and get to work finishing off her project. Updates were constant and clear, and only a month after completion she put up a post saying that rewards are out in the wild. And this was when Mr. Farron struck. Obviously, he couldn't cancel his pledge anymore, so instead he went to Amazon Payments and filed a claim against the campaign owner asking for his $1,000 back. Now apparently, when an email like this comes through from Amazon Payments, or at least this used to be the case, no name is given, but obviously $1,000 was a significant amount of that $4,300 total. And it was pretty obvious who was asking for their money back after the rewards were sent out. Alex did what she could to fight this, but at the time there was absolutely no way for the campaign owner to report a backer. Heck, you couldn't even block a backer either. And after getting an extremely bog standard response from Kickstarter themselves, explaining that she needed to simply go over to the Amazon Payments FAQ, she started to investigate a little more. Turns out that Mr. Farron was indeed quite the busy boy. A total of 156 projects were targeted, obviously all had physical rewards ranging from a few hundred dollars to thousands of dollars, and all of the ones that were successful also had chargebacks after the rewards had been shipped out. Annoyingly, the vast majority of this information is coming from reliable news sources that were covering the story back in late 2013, but trying to find out exactly how much this mystery man did indeed get away with and trying to find out what projects he or she, let's be honest with ourselves, nobody knows who this is, well, it's all gone. Because the user's profile did eventually get blocked and the account was suspended by Kickstarter themselves and they released the following statement. Kickstarter and Amazon Payments, our US payments processor, were recently alerted to a series of malicious pledges by a single individual to more than 100 Kickstarter projects. Upon learning this information, we shut down this person's account, cancelled their live pledges and permanently banned them from Kickstarter. Kickstarter and Amazon are working together to investigate this situation. We won't let a single bad apple harm the integrity or goodwill of our incredible community. And with that, Ensik Farhan was gone. Kickstarter did what they could, but the guy got away with it up to this point, and that bloody sucks. Like I said, not every single one of these 156 projects did hit target, but from what I've read, at least 100 of them did, and at least $6,000 was completely ripped off of the campaign owners. And if you want further proof of how far this guy actually went, well, allow me to show you this post called Kickstarter Project Creators Beware over on the unofficial crowdfunding blog www.kickstarterforum.org. Several pages that were posted in real time by creators shouting out about this individual. He contributed 1000 to my campaign at the last minute. At first his credit card was denied but he updated his info and the transaction cleared. He also pledged to our project $1,000. I got burned as well, $850 from NSIC Farron. The individual donated $5,000 to our non-profit arts organization project. We can in no way reimburse this money. This NSIC Farron pledged $5,000 and the transaction came through. I just received a dispute email on Friday from Amazon Payments for NSIC Farron's $2,500 pledge to my project. NSIC Farron pledged over $1,700 to our campaign for the Monkey Light Pro. Guys, these posts go on and on and on. 
This guy was utter scum. Kickstarter's worst nightmare. He got away with an insane amount of scamming and there was even a post found within this thread that shows he wasn't going to stop at just stealing rewards. A question for everybody, did he ever ask for any favours? I remember him asking me, after the $1,100 that he pledged hit my bank, for an iPhone 5. He said, you don't have to send me the reward, can I instead ask for a favour? It is very hard for me in my country to get iPhone 5, can you buy that for me with the money? Later posts show off the name he was using on the credit cards, of which there was a few. There was a couple of emails listed that he used and even a direct telephone number. All of which are obviously fake. And the thread eventually just dwindles down to nothing but new campaign owners thanking the original poster for shining light onto this individual. Oh, and you know what else? Kickstarter, again at the time this was all happening at least, never initially refunded campaign owners the fees that they charged and only ever did this after the story became widespread. Yeah, think of that what you will. So, quite the change up right guys, a small amount of money per campaign, sure, but enough to completely obliterate certain campaign owners. Seriously, $1,000 taken away from a $4,300 total? That's pretty harsh, especially considering if the credit company did decide to go ahead with it, there is literally nothing the campaign owner could have done. The money would have literally been deducted no matter if it had been spent or not. Thankfully, however, Kickstarter went ahead and added a few extra features to stop this happening again in the future. And although it's not completely gone away, it most definitely was never as bad as this. Hey there, guys. Thanks again for watching this video. This is a uh, obviously a compilation video which I've just put out. And uh, yeah, I'm working on a massive kick scammer video uh, which should be coming up hopefully next week and i've got a really really big complete history that i've been working on for I, I don't even know how long maybe half a year uh really really excited about that one uh so yeah this is the part of the video where i give a massive shout out to all of my patrons all of my youtube members and of course for this episode i want to give a massive shout out to my sponsor fun plus go and check out all of those games i talked about earlier on there'll be links down in the description if you want to go check those out but let's give a massive shout out to all of the patrons and youtube members that allow me to create videos like this with an extra big shout out going to Aaron Gorman, Agro Crag, Akatimo84, Amelia Lou, Andrew Dalton, Arista, Ashley Philpot, Benjamin Guy, Ben Zuko, uh, Boots and Pup, Bram Perez, Chev Matic, Christopher Devero, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, to Action Saxon, Dina, Dina Anyone, Derekuda, Game Apologist, Ian Quell, uh, Jay's Man Child, Jabberel, Aiden, James, Jeff Mianowski, John Rogers, Jura, Cat Layton, Man Shovel, Matt Jackson, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nicholas Burtner, Over Jarl Zane, Roll VP, Ray Blair, Richard Aldegic, Rovan Army, Ryan Burford, Ryan Holtz, Sir Nielsen, Sh um, Shadow Dragon, Stephen, That Gamer, the, the Old Man Cometh, The Sneaky Ferret, Tim Lunn, Todd Paul Float G, Vitas Varnes, Vike Echo, Ye Old Hamburglar, and Ziggy uh, Golightly. Ziggy Golightly? I hope I'm saying that right. I do apologize if not. Regardless, thank you to all of you guys, and, and uh, like I said, today's sponsor. Thank you to everybody that's helping me um, uh, make videos like this so I can work on the really big new videos that I'm working on as well behind the scenes. I'm super chuffed with what I've got coming out, and uh, it's because of these people that I'm able to do this very thing. But anyway, guys, massive thanks to all of you, and uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you all next time. Catch you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>